Um, Thank you so much, Angel, um, for the lovely introduction. I am going to screen, and please don't pay any attention to the mess that is my desktop. Um, okay. So I'd like to start by saying that this is going to be an idiosyncratic journey to the spaces where my research took me through the mythological, the culinary, the epistemological, and the taxonomic aspects of my topic, mushrooms in the African diaspora. Since I didn't know what to expect from my exploration, this presentation reflects how I moved through the information gathering process. And as a result, that won't always look like a straight line and will perhaps raise more questions that it even attempts to answer. So, um, long and the short of it, this talk is not so much about completism, it's more of a survey. What we'll do is we'll crane our necks to look down some of the rabbit holes I found when I got curious about mushrooms in African contexts and their diasporic lineages. I welcome good faith attempts at correction in the chat on basically anything but Latin binomial pronunciation. I just really don't care. Um, and at the end, I'd also love to hear if you have more sources on this subject that you can point me to, or experiences of your own that relate to mushrooms in the African diaspora. So in August, when I delivered a version of this talk, an earlier version, um, David Aurora offered some notes. So you would be in good company if you offered me corrections. Um, so. I'm especially interested in any stories you might have about ways Black and Indigenous folks might have conversed about mushrooms. Um, all right, so spore. Um, I love etymologies, I'm a word nerd. Um, so when we look at the etymology of spore, I'd like for us to notice that its root means to spread or to sow. And I want us to hold that meaning in mind as we make our way through these materials. I also want you to keep in mind that the lovely folks at the Central Texas Mycological Society are giving away a print by a visionary Jamaican American artist, Paul Lewin um, at my behest. So you should really pay attention um, because you'll be quizzed on something appearing in this presentation. And the first one to answer correctly will win a mushroomy print by him. Um, I just love his work. Like, I mean, look at it. Um, and I love this quote by him. Um, also, the figures in my work represent my ancestors, ancient ancestors, futuristic ancestors, interdimensional ancestors. Okay. So I would like to start with a question for folks. Um, how many of you can tell me what your ancestors' relationship to fungi was? You can put answers in the chat, you can um, raise your hand, you can unmute yourself maybe, but I'd love to hear what some of those answers are. Um, <laughs> so po Polish ancestry, um, wild harvested, um, yeah, one of the people to get me into mushrooms was a Polish, a Polish woman, and it was a national pastime for them. Um, Irish ancestry, mycophobia all the way, really ties into something, <laughs> to, to an aspect of what I'll be delving deeper into. All right, so some of you all know, okay. I thought none, but recently learned that while hiding from the Nazis, they lived largely on fungi in Ukraine and Polish borderlands. Yeah. Croatians um, ate mushrooms, cherished them. The rest of your lineage feared them. Um, Morel, Hunter, Grandpa. Okay, so it looks like there are folks that ha are in touch with some of their um, more mycophilic um, ancestry and some other people are saying that, you know, there was a mix or folks were mostly mycophobic. So interesting mix. Um, one of my favorite 
um, stories of ancestral fungal knowledge comes from a course I taught last year to senior citizens on memoir writing. One day, one of the memoirists shared their mother-in-law had passed on a recipe for chicken cacciatore that called for mushrooms. Apparently, a relative would forage Cyclosabi agerida or thereabouts somewhere in Boston, um, where I'm usually located. I'm in Florida right now. And the in-law would put a quarter into the pot with them as they cooked. If the quarter turned black, she knew that the relative had picked some poisonous ones, as she put it. So when I heard this, the storyteller in me exalted and the mushroom person was like, <laughs> wow, sounds like a good way to get poison to me. Um, but I digress. So it seems like a lot of you have a sense, some of you have a sense of those traditions. So um, you might be familiar with this chart from the late great Gary Linkoff's The Complete Mushroom Hunter. Here, he, in an efficient but somewhat reductive way, categorizes whole continents, countries, and regions as either mycophobic or mycophilic. To hear this chart tell it, if you're not from East Asia, continental Europe, or other loosely defined ethnic regions, it's unlikely that a love for or even tolerance of fungi is your inheritance. But I wanna read a little bit between the lines of this chart. So when I see scattered peoples in West and East Africa, that isn't very evocative to me and it makes me wanna fill in the blanks and paint a more complete picture. Um, so I went mycophile hunting and here is some of what I found. So in the 1980s, American musicologist Louis Sarno recorded some singularly beautiful sounds that he described as women gathering mushrooms. This song captures Aka women in what is now the Central African Republic engaged in mushroom foraging, their voices reverberating through the forest. Those of you who read Merlin Sheldrake's Entangled Life might remember his mention of this song and its use of a masterly polyphonic vocal technique. Um, I'll start this. And if you have any feelings during the recording, please feel free to drop them in the chat. So bear with me as I remember how to use Zoom. Um, I'm going to There we go. Um, and then I'm going to share my screen once more and optimize it for a sound. All right. All right, so that goes on, obviously. 
Um, and I encourage you to check it out um, in its entirety because it's just stunning. Um, it fits so perfectly into the sounds of the environment. Um, my three-year-old says it sounds happy. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it does make you want to hang out with them, right? <laughs> um, so when I heard this, um, I felt that um, it became super clear to me what Sheldrake meant when he said, mycelium is polyphony in bodily form. Um, it was just like, let that sink in. It's such a beautiful sentiment um, and you know, a, a great visualization of that sound. Um, so moving along, The next thing to grab and hold my interest was a story from the Baganda people of Uganda. As you'll see, so much of what I found about mushrooms in Africa comes from this area. So I think it must be an important sporulator for the diaspora. Um, this is an origin story of a clan called the Butiko, which means mushroom. This story was told to musicologist and professor Dr. Damascus Kafumbe by a drummer in the Kaganda tradition of music. It's from the professor's 2018 book, Tuning the Kingdom. I'm just gonna read the story as he wrote it down. So, <laughs> near the beginning of the 14th century, a man named Kebagaba set out to hunt animals in the company of his two sons. However, the three hunters never caught any game. On their way back home, they decided to collect firewood and forage for food. While doing so, they stumbled upon a thicket filled with small, white, delicate mushrooms called butiko. Kebagaba and his sons decided to pick the butiko. As they were collecting the fungi, a man with whom Kebagaba was competing for leadership stealthily approached and assaulted him. The victim's two sons ran in panic to inform their relatives and friends about their father's misfortune. On hearing the news, the relatives and friends rushed to the scene in hopes of rescuing Kebagaba. However, they found neither him nor the bundle of firewood and butiko he had been collecting. In order to ease their grief, Kebagaba's relatives resolved never to eat the butiko that had led to the attack. These events led to the establishment of the butiko clan, with the butiko serving as the clan's primary totem, or muziro. When Kebagaba vanished, his surviving relatives approached the sage and expressed to him their grief over the mysterious disappearance of their loved one. The mourners were particularly disturbed by their failure to locate and bury his remains appropriately. So in response, the sage assured the mourners that supernatural forces had carried the remains to the moon. Before long, the grievers saw what they believed to be their deceased relatives on the moon carrying a bundle of firewood on his head. They also saw what looked to them like the butico he had picked before the attack strewn all over the moon's surface. So that's the story the butico clan tells about how the butico, the mushroom, became their totem and thus taboo for them to eat. However, apparently there is a baganda phrase that encourages members of other clans who do not consider the butico a clan totem to harvest and eat them. And there's another phrase that advises potential consumers of the fungi on how to pick them, uproot them completely without letting their caps become detached from the bases. So this to me sounds kind of like that old chestnut of a debate, the pull don't cut argument. So anyway, um, responses to this tale, does anyone have um, thoughts on sort of the way that played out? Like, um, any thoughts on the mythologizing that seems to be going on? Had, had anyone heard that story before? No? Cool. Okay, cool. My favorite thing is how the story seems like it could be mycophobic about a prohibition. Then you kind of realize that though there is a taboo, 
the story is developing a culture in which this clan identifies with the mushroom, treats it as like a relative, right? And other clans actually get advice about how to harvest the butico for the table. Uh, that seems to me to be very mycophilic. Um, and it reads just to me a little bit like the kind of mythologizing that could have taken place if a forebear had picked the wrong mushrooms and been poisoned. Um, so this is where Mr. Aurora's note came in. Um, it was pointed out to me after uh, the earlier version of the talk that apparently um, there was an Amazonian study of more than 200 food items that showed that every single food was taboo amongst at least one group of people, strong evidence that food taboos function mostly to unite people in the same way that a common enemy does. In addition to that, he gave me another brief mushroom tale from Africa. Quoth Aurora, in Zambia, Samfue or Termitomyces microcarpus is a prized uh, edible. And I have heard different versions of a tale explaining how the Bisa people used to live together in harmony until a woman found a lot of Samfue during a time of great hardship and refused to share with her neighbors. So this led the Bisa to, into splitting into two groups, the mushroom clan for the woman and her defenders and the crocodile clan for those who did not forgive her. So thank you for that um, tidbit, Mr. Aurora. So I'm gonna throw the slides back up, but first I'm going to share my screen again. How y'all feeling out there? <laughs> Great, right. this is so fascinating. Ah, love to hear it, love to hear it. Um, okay, so next, oh, I guess I didn't really need to go to this. Um, so next, um, we move to another origin story of sorts. It's a West African tale about how mushrooms came to be read with big children's book narrator vibes by this dude, and you'll hear it in a second. Okay. How Mushrooms First Grew from West African Folk Tales by William William H. Barker. Long ago there dwelt in a town two brothers whose bad habits brought them much trouble. Day by day they got more deeply in debt. Their creditors gave them no peace. So at last they ran away into the woods. They became highway robbers. But they were not happy. Their minds were troubled by their evil deeds. At last they decided to go home, make a big farm, and pay off their debts gradually. They accordingly set to work, and soon had quite a fine farm prepared for corn. As the soil was good, they hoped the harvest would bring them in much money. Unfortunately, that very day a bush fowl came along. Being hungry, it scratched up all the newly planted seeds and ate them. The two poor brothers, on arriving at the field next day, were dismayed to find all their work quite wasted. They put down a trap for the thief. That evening the bush fowl was caught in it. The two brothers, when they came and found the bird, told it that now all their debts would be transferred to it, because it had robbed them of the means of paying the debts themselves. The poor bird, in great trouble at having such a burden thrust upon it, made a nest under a silk cotton tree. There it began to lay eggs, meaning to hatch them, and sell the young birds for money to pay off the debts. A terrible hurricane came, however, and a branch of the tree came down. 
all the eggs were smashed. As a result, the bush fowl transferred the debts to the tree, as it had broken the eggs. The silk cotton tree was in dismay at having such a big sum of money to pay off. It immediately set to work to make as much silk cotton as it possibly could, that it might sell it. An elephant, not knowing all that had happened, came along. Seeing the silk cotton, he came to the tree and plucked down all its bearings. By this means the debts were transferred to the poor elephant. The elephant was very sad when he found what he'd done. He wandered away into the desert, thinking of a way to make money. He could think of none. As he stood quietly under a tree, a poor hunter crept up. This man thought he was very lucky to find such a fine elephant standing so still. He at once shot him. Just before the animal died, he told the hunter that now the debts would have to be paid by him. The hunter was much grieved when he heard this, as he had no money at all. He walked home wondering what he could do to make enough money to pay the debts. In the darkness he did not see the stump of a tree which the overseers had cut down in the road. He fell and broke his leg. By this means the debts were transferred to the tree stump. Not knowing this, a party of white ants came along next morning and began to eat into the tree. When they had broken it nearly to the ground, the tree told them that now the debts were theirs, as they had killed it. The ants, being very wise, held a council together to find out how best they could make money. They decided each to contribute as much as possible. With the proceeds, one of their young men would go to the nearest market and buy pure linen thread. This they would weave and sell, and the profits would go to help pay the debts. This was done. From time to time all the linen in stock was brought and spread out in the sunshine to keep it in good condition. When men see this linen lying out on the anthills, they call it mushroom, and gather it for food. End of How Mushrooms First. All right. Um, any responses to that one? I just love the idea of like silk and the, um, the sort of weaving in all of the rest of the animal kingdom into the story of mushrooms. Um, all right. So I'm going to throw the presentation back up. Um, I kind of liked how the debt was just kind of passed along. Like, you know, it takes a village. Everybody has to pitch in and, and own it. Um, that, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, how do we find that and hear more stories? Um, so I, what I did was literally just searched um, for mushrooms in African context. I looked um, on the web. I, all of my um, mushroom books, sometimes like if, if their surveys um, mention um, mushrooms in African and diasporic contexts, um, peripherally, so you have to sort of do your own digging. Um, but I love what Kathy is saying in the chat, because um, this is a really great way to just connect folks who might be interested in the same things. And um, I think, yeah, it could be cool. I, I'll see what Trad has to say. Um, and I really appreciate those sorts of connections. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. Sorry, I'm a little klutzier with this. It's been a while. Okay. So as we know, not everything worth knowing was or needs to be written down. Um, it's difficult for me to say that as a, a writer, but I feel it to be true in my bones, so I must say it. <laughs> um, what's more, it doesn't have to be written down in languages that are accessible to outsiders. But this can be hard on those of us who have become estranged from their ancestry in ways that make our roots unclear. 
On the other hand, it can also be a little disappointing to get this information at a slant from sources who do not have flesh and blood ties to the culture they're collecting knowledge from. Sources who might even have ulterior motives in recording, selecting, and presenting these histories. What does it mean that the collector of the, that folktale we just heard, William H. Barker, was a white American missionary in Nigeria in the early 20th century and a principal of a govern, government school in Accra? What does it mean that this man gets the byline for that book, along with a co-author, Cecilia Sinclair, who rarely gets mentioned? For that matter, what does it mean that I, a Jamaican-American, am giving you a non-exhaustive, non-specialist survey of this topic? I mean, obviously, I'm satisfied with the answer to that last question after looking into my own motives, or I wouldn't be here. But I think it's imperative to ask when presented with information on whose authority and to what end. So anyway, one of the only things that seems clear to me from this vantage is that people with stories like these, who have knowledge of what fungi are doing embedded into the stories they tell about themselves, are operating from a place of mycophilia. And these mycophilic traditions are continuing into the present in many forms. So y'all might be familiar with this. So Gary, Gary Linkoff's quote, unquote, scattered peoples in West and East and Central and Southern Africa gathered Tromidomyces titanicus, a species of fungus that produces one of the largest fruiting bodies to eat and to sell. Um, by the way, Tromidomyces titanicus, as the name suggests, is farmed by termite symbionts that cultivate it on partly digested plant material. It may be that the energy saved by the mushroom due to the symbios symbiosis helps it grow to such huge, you know, um, fruits. So scattered peoples in Central Africa, Uganda, also gather another termite farm fungus, Terminomyces microcarpus, to make the sauce that a girl's mother serves to her before um, her wedding night. Um, they forage for Amanita zambiana, or nehedzi, and make a reportedly delicious cream or broth-based soup with it. It should be noted that Nehedzi can also refer to Termitomyces microcarpus. So scattered peoples in West and East Africa today also grow and farm mushrooms in small and large scale operations. And the growing of mushrooms is a source of economic empowerment. It's also part of a sound food security strategy. Mushrooms are known as poor man's meat for people scattered about that continent, just as it, as it is for people scattered about North America. So now I just want to bring in the voices of some contemporary African women working with mushrooms so we can see these traditions as they continue to fruit and sporulate. Here is a clip from a BBC podcast about a mushroom farmer and educator in Zimbabwe um, by the name of Chido Govera. Come on, you can do it. It doesn't want to do it, though. The of the up the house and mushroom was and my sorry, my fancy way a little. And real, you know. My first experiences with mushrooms were with forage mushrooms. And I would go in the forest with my grandmother, sit her down, and I would run around collecting different types of mushrooms, bring them to her. And she was so knowledgeable that without her sight uh, uh, working well anymore, she could smell the mushrooms and she could tell which mushroom was edible, which mushroom was poisonous. And she would teach me things like, when you harvest mushrooms in the forest, first of all, you have to cut and leave the stem in the ground. And, uh, and when you take some, uh, the mushrooms with the gills, you have to cook them in a pot which is open. 
and then you keep the door of the house open. And if you ask why we had to do all those things, she says, it's so that the gods of the forest will give you more mushrooms next year. If you close the port, you close the forest. All right, so um, did anything about that clip strike anyone? It really is beautiful. Yeah. I I was just going to say, it, I was reading the narrative as you were uh, like trying to get the volume up and <laughs> marrying someone like 30 years the senior was kind of scary, especially at age 10. But her life did take that different path and her voice sounded so strong and mm. confident. It was mm. It was really... Awesome, the, the her journey. Mm, absolutely, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Rebecca. Um, what I found so fascinating about this idea of smell as a primary way of identifying edible mushrooms. Um, I mean, of course, we use you, you know folks in a Western context use smell. Um, and of course, even though she can't see them all, um, because you know the the grandmother's um, sense of sight was 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 leaving her, um, she can still feel their shape and size. But it's still striking to me to hear of such a different epistemological relationship to mush mushrooms, a different but still deep way of knowing them. Um, and whereas the quarter in the pot of boiling mushrooms is clearly a folk wisdom that can get you poisoned. I find it a little bit easier to believe in the accuracy of this grandmother's wisdom for some reason. Um, but this requires being comfortable with ways of doing things that are a little bit more mysterious to us. And I don't expect you to follow me there. Um, that intergenerational knowledge is amazing. Um, yeah, it does make you wanna like, because I don't know, there might be something, yeah, I don't know. Um, the first thing I learned was the smell of swirling. Yep. Good to hear. Yeah. Um, thank you for the full podcast in the chat, Sally. I think it's interesting how some important details about preparation are kept and retold, even if the speaker may no longer know why. Absolutely. Um, oh, that's that's cool, Kevin. My Ukrainian great grandmother was blind and would hunt for pidpanke or armillaria by smell. So cool. Yeah, I mean, all of these mushrooms have amazing, you know, characteristics that, you know, go beyond what we see. Mm, thank you for sharing these stories. Okay, so um, in the interest of not keeping you all forever, I'm going to move on, though I want to keep seeing some of these things um, that popped up for you appearing in the chat. Um, all right. So if you've moved in online mushroom circles for a while, you may have seen a video or two from the exuberant Ugandan community worker and educator, Josephine Nakakande. If not, allow me to introduce you to this hardworking gem of a, an individual. Josephine's energy and enthusiasm for sustainable agriculture and farming and the empowerment of women therewith is infectious. She founded Eco Agaric Uganda in 2007 as a means of extending her community work, um, teaching local women principles of sustain sustainable agriculture. Josephine and her staff work tirelessly to train the populations in the towns where they operate in ecologically friendly farming techniques. Much of this work is made possible by the donation of organizations and individuals in the US. I corresponded with her and she told me about these mushroom related traditions she grew up observing. Mushrooms are important culturally, to quote um, Josephine, for important ceremonies like celebrating the birth of twins and marriage. So they must never be missing on these occasions, mushrooms. They, they simply mustn't. There is no blessing without them. You should not talk or shout while on a mushroom hunting mission. 
And we used to go hunting mushrooms as soon as the rain started. Even now they are hunting, they are hunted in Bogoma forest. Um, so here's the link to donate once you do. Josephine's wonderful about sharing, um, showing you exactly where the funds you sent are going. So you might get a cute video of Ugandan school kids singing you a song. And as you can see, no matter how isolated and small these communities of African mycophiles might be, their stories are out there. And it's plain to see that the diaspora can find inspiration there, should we choose to. So now that we've surveyed some of the mushroom traditions of Africa, let's follow the spreading spores overseas to the Caribbean. Here we've got our first example of diasporic mycophilia in the form of a painting by Haitian artist, Hugues Ferrol. When I first saw this, I was like, ah, you're never alone with mushrooms. And then I was like, I want some of what she's having. Um, you can find more of his work at itgallery.com. I just love it. Um, and if you visit this link and happen to find this painting and have 900 francs to spare, there is about an inch of empty space on the walls in my room back in Boston um, that could use some filling and I accept gifts. Just kidding. Or am I? Yes, I am. All right, so how many of you have encountered the Haitian dish, John John rice or black rice before? Let's see in the chat. Yes, I love the extra S's. That is the right amount of enthusiasm. So this is my, ver the, um, this is my version and I've got some um, Latiparus Cincinnatus um, there uh, doesn't usually, this dish doesn't usually have chicken of the woods in it or black trumpets. Um, but I uh, added some for the color and the flair. Um, okay, so it sounds like, you know, some of you have never seen black rice. You're in for a treat when you finally make the leap. Um, this rice dish is both dyed black and flavored by fungus, and it is exquisite. For those of you who haven't encounter encountered it, allow me to present you with an example of what can happen when someone samples this dish and didn't know what they were getting into. Um, I'm about to play another clip. I think this is the last one. So this is a Nigerian TikTok personality who in um, his last video, the, the video preceding this one, sampled black rice for the first time. In this clip, you'll see him go back to the restaurant where the obsession began. Um, ooh, whoops. And... Okay. Better than basmati. I think you could actually probably make black rice with basmati if you wanted to. Um, all right, so I'm gonna stop the share and then share it properly. Okay. So <laughs> listen, listen carefully to this. Oh, why is the... Guys, the obsession is too real. Ah, I'm not joking with you people. See, I came back for that black rice. You, you people would think... Ah. He took the whole store. Dilly John John, Dilly John John. They have see. no more black rice. I finished the whole... See, I finished the black they rice. They have no here. more turkey. I finished the turkey. See, everything is here. He took their flag. <laughs> ah, this is healthy food. Oh, stop.
stop. It just goes right in the top just of the cake. Just right into the top of the cake like that. All right. I'm all right. Blue. I don't know why everything has to always autoplay all the time. <laughs> yes, this dish makes people uh, go wild, as you can see. Um, and there's a very good reason for that because it's very, very delicious. Um, let me throw this back up. Okay, so um, and now that you know what the treasure is at the end of this particular rainbow, let's take a look at the steps I took to try to figure out what the recipe, what the uh, mushroom is behind this dish because sources were mixed. Um, and then I promised a recipe. So in the early um, summer of last year, I was working on an article about reimagining recipes in Im immigrant families using local ingredients in the US context. Specifically, I was trying to pin down what local species of mushroom most closely resembles John John in scent, so I could attempt to pick it in Florida where I was visiting my mother. Um, so meta information around the recipes had informed me that the mushroom grows in the north of Haiti and that some people think that when fresh, its scent is pungent and even putrid. That detail hung me up a bit because nothing I had encountered in the family Cephyralaceae um, had ever been particularly stinky. So I finally let it drop for a while, but I didn't forget my quest to pinpoint the Jean Jean species which is why I was so excited to pick it up again for this talk. After finding a scholarly article suggesting that John John might be Sathyrella coprinoseps, I went to Mushroom Observer to look at the species. I saw one entry for P. coprinoseps from Puerto Rico and was immediately put in mind of Termitomyces microcarpus. Is that a coincidence? I mean, maybe it could be, but I don't know. I don't know. I also saw that user Kurt Miller had made an observation of Candoliomyces cacao with an accompanying photo of a bag of dried specimens and that this observation was from Haiti and that he was um, calling it Jean Jean. So I was intrigued. Later, I saw that the same fellow had made an inquiry in a Facebook group we're both in a few years back wondering whether a set of, picture, uh, set of pictures of dried, fragile looking dark spored mushrooms could be John John. So I messaged him on the book of face and this is the exchange that ensued, um, shared with his permission. So it turns out that those who have considered this question really want a definitive answer, but that the answer might well be John John is Condoliomyces, except when it isn't. So who knows uh, whether the mushrooms I bought off Etsy dried um, and used to make Diri Jean Jean from my co-op were Condoliomyces or not. I, I don't know. So look at them. Maybe, maybe that's what they are. Um, so since Craterellus phallus or black, black trumpet um, is one of my favorite edible species, and it also dyes things black. Um, and we've been, we had been enjoying an incredible harvest uh, last year. I tossed a few in the pot. So here you'll see the recipe I followed for black rice. I'm probably a bad person in that I find it a little hard to follow another person's recipe, even when I'm making something for the first time. Um, but in this case, I can perhaps be forgiven for honoring the dietary restrictions of my housemates. Some recipes call for the addition of dried shrimp and cashews, both of which would promptly poison certain members of my co-op. So let me just check. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. What is scotch but bon bonnet? Scotch bonnet is a type of hot pepper um, that grows in the Caribbean. And 
<laughs> Thank you, Krista. <laughs> um, so I can actually, um, if someone from the Mycological Society wants, um, I can have this um, recipe sent to y'all if you if you'd like, or you can screenshot it now, um, whatever works. But That'd be great. Yeah, we'll put it up on our blog with a link to the, the live stream. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So um, at in um, August of last year, as I was giving the talk, um, Haiti, the first um, free Black Republic, was in the grips of yet another breathtaking tragedy and humanitarian crisis. Um, and I'm, I know that they can still use our help. And I know it's easy these days with so much falling apart to experience a little bit of empathy fatigue, but I think this is exactly the moment when we should fight that fatigue and feel with our fellow mycophiles around the world. So um, if y'all want to, um, you can um, use this link as a place to, to donate. Um, so. A little bit of a change of pace. Back in December of 2019, I visited my grandmother in the mountains beyond Kingston, um, Jamaica, which is not unusual for me. But what was unusual was the time of year because it had been decades since I'd been in Jamaica for Christmas. Um, so in Massachusetts of that year, we'd had an erratic rainy season. So I was especially excited to look for mushrooms around my old home which overlooks a lush tropical forest. So as usual, I'd been talking about mushrooms just like a normal amount. Um, and under the influence of that, my uncle kept an eye out. Then he showed me some mushrooms that had sprung up overnight in our backyard and asked what they were. And I didn't know. Um, and I also couldn't find them in my um, Southeastern US field guide. Um, so, there and there weren't any mushroom observer observations um, for that region. So I went to, you guessed it, Facebook. And there I had um, an exchange with an expert. Um, so I gave all the characteristics and I showed the picture. Um, and they, I mean, they're kind of a lovely mushroom. Um, so I got the, the, um, you know, uh, the ID that I needed. So in the section of the complete mushroom hunter where Mr. Linkoff's chart appears, there's also a note about how any place Great Britain extended its reach was befouled by that empire's craven distrust of the kingdom fungi. And Jamaica is no exception. Um, we're gonna trouble that idea for in, in a moment, but um, for now, when I offered my grandmother a tiny fried morsel of this delicious mushroom that had come up in her yard, she gave me her patented dubious look. And here's that patented dubious look. But then, miracle of miracles, she tasted it and said it tasted fine. So when I asked her if she would ever eat it again though, she smiled slyly at me and gesture, gestured that the subject was closed. Um, but I might continue to work on her. At present, if you want to find a Jamaican recipe with mushrooms in it, you're likely to run into examples of Ital cookery. So um, Ital cookery um, is uh, in the cooking in the Rastafarian tradition. And it's all about increasing one's vitality through the things one consumes by avoiding meat, iodized salt, artificial flavors and colors, and embracing um, organic unprocessed foods from the earth wherever possible. Fast forward once more to June, 2021 and foraging with my mother. While I was trying to put together that article I mentioned before, we were looking for mushrooms to eat on the nature trail in her condo complex of all places. We didn't eat those Luco agaricus fruits that you see in the picture, but I was teeing out a bowl eat that I thought maybe had some potential. And my mother marveled out loud at how long it was taking me 
and how involved the process seemed to be. So I was like, yeah, they look pretty similar to these organisms. That's how they get you. And then she said, back home in Jamaica, we only have two names for mushrooms, Junjo and Duppy Umbrella. So Duppy means ghost in Jamaican Patois. So I, I'm, I'm just gonna pause to let you enjoy the very goth image of ghosts using mushroom umbrellas. But three things raced through my mind at that moment. One, it was amazing to me that it only took her about three and a half years into my debilitating obsession to mention such a minor detail as duppy umbrellas and junjo. Two, I could remember hearing the word junjo or junjo growing up, but it was used to mean schmutz or fuzz or something untidy or unclean. So I never fully absorbed its meaning as mold or mildew um, or fungus more generally. And three, junjo and janjan sound remarkably similar to me. I was not the only one to think that last thought, which became clear when I looked into it a little bit further. So I know this is too much um, text for a slide, but uh, I, I encourage you to look up this article. Um, in this article published in the journal American Speech in 1958, Robert Wallace Thompson, an Irish linguist, wants to find the African root to the words Junjo and John John. He seemed to not have found it, at least not definitively. However, I was stoked to see what he went on to say in this article. So, on this page, he reports on the fieldwork of a colleague who had spoken to Jamaicans about the edibility of certain mushrooms, which is huge. This fieldwork done in 1952, 10 years before Jamaican independence is exciting to me because it hints at and teases at the possibility of a hidden mycophilia, which I want us to reseed, to, to, to re-sow. Um, so in this, in the first sentence, he says, I would conclude that the inquest on Junjo must be reopened. And I want, I, I want just here for us to consider the inquest reopened. Um, I made that similar leap to him also about Gullah people, um, Gullah people's mushroom traditions. I know they must exist. They just must be hidden by like oral traditions um, and, you know, uh, just a lack of documentation. Um, but I, I just, I have a just gut feeling that they exist. And since I'm not a scientist, I'm a storyteller, I can just go with my gut and be like, yeah, Termitomyces microcarpus and Candoliomyces species look similar. So maybe that was like, there was a linkage there. Um, so yeah, I, I encourage you all, especially if you have Caribbean friends who might also be mushroom people to get them to ask their, their you know, um, elders, just um i found so many people with stories that they didn't think necessarily would mean anything in this context um that ended up being cool linkages um that would be great to to just explore further okay so now seated more firmly in the present with a sense of awe and expectancy as to where we can go from here, I'll leave you with some glimpses of what I like to call mycofuturism. Ahead of this talk, I contacted Teresa Meza, a chef and caterer who works in Mexico City to deliver beautiful, authentic Jamaican food to that population. She came across an article about my foraging and learned I was Jamaican. So she reached out to say that she appreciated my loving mushrooms out loud like this, um, and that I should come to Mexico where she would um, love to feed me. And it wasn't until I asked her about her use of fungi on her own menus a couple of days before the first talk that she confessed she would put them on her catering menus for vegans and vegetarians, but she was a little bit shyer about including them in other dishes because of the stigma back home. 
In a series of more and more excited Instagram messages, I pointed her to evidence that we are not as uniformly mycophobic as some of us had thought. So she then told me that she has plans to farm mushrooms and that she loved eating and hunting them um, personally and that um, she had commenced a private study. Um, and here's just a video I really like of my own modest mushroom cookery, some black trumpets and hen of the wood simmering away in some Jamaican curry. Um, so <clears throat> we're fruiting everywhere in the form of microscopist, um, uh, in the form of a microscopist planting a truffle orchard in the mid-Atlantic region. Here's Jasmine Richardson mounting a slide with the lateral root of a baby tree that she hopes will show black winter truffle mycorrhizas when placed under the scope. We're fruiting as artists with psychedelic mushrooms on our minds. Jay Percy is a Jamaican British painter and obia practitioner who depicts her black trumpet or her black trumpets, who depicts her black subjects communing with psilocybin. Um, it will be interesting to see what happens over the next several years as foreigners flock to Jamaica to open centers for psilocyb psilocybin therapy, since the compound is not illegal there. What, what is the likelihood that these centers will continue colonial models of resource extraction without benefit to average Jamaicans? Um, and how do we ensure that they don't? We're fruiting as authors and educators answering the call to bring our black mycophilia to even wider audiences. Here you can see William Padilla Brown and Alexis Nicole Nelson, um, who are wildly popular. Um, anyone who lives with me as Jonah here does, learns uh, more than they ever thought they needed to know about the fungi we live with. And in fact, any walk we take through the green areas um, of the city turn into mushroom hunts. It's always fun to see folks um, become excited when they start spotting them everywhere. And here he is picking up an old man. So I wanted to end this video with this video. <clears throat> and silly sounds aside, um, I wanted to just emphasize the spore in diaspora the scattering, the sowing. You never know where a single spore will end up. And in the West, Black people are considered marginalized, but the margins are a place of power. Whether our histories of mycophilia have been buried on purpose or lost to the winds or just lost in translation, as Black mycophiles, we can now imaginatively trace our lineages. We can accept mushrooms as part of our family, like the Butico clan, we can see ourselves in many places and times. We can attempt to be visionaries in the Paul Lewin vein. We can also imagine and enact micro futures for ourselves. Thank you so much, y'all, for your time and attention. Um, I'm here, uh, and and thank you so much for um, letting me be a part of your community in this way. Yeah, thank you so much. That was so beautiful. Yes. <laughs> oh, good, uh, good comments and questions going on. Lots of snaps. Everybody's happy. <laughs> 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 thank you oh, so much. We... That was so inspiring. And thank I love you. how you tied it in with the spore. It was beautiful. <laughs> um, um, the question, I forgot to ask the question. Um, for the oh, print. Yes, yes. <laughs> do we want to do that now? Yeah. Um, yeah. So we are going to be giving away one of uh, Paul Lewin's prints. So Maria is going to ask a question and I'll be watching the chat on Zoom closely for the first correct answer. And then, um, you know, we'll just need you to share, email us uh, from our website, just share your um, address and we'll get that sent out to you. Um, so yeah, so 
whenever you're ready, Maria, we will do the candles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what is the name of the termite mountain mushroom? What is the Latin binomial? Binomial. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, we got it. <laughs> yes, oh. Lauren and Jack. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, Lauren, if you can email us, we have a form on our uh, website that you can find. Just send us your contact info, and we will be sending out a print. Great. Thank you, guys. Wow. Yay! Thank, you, thank you for so coming to talk, Maria. It's incredible. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening, <laughs> for contributing. Yeah, and um, there was a hand up, but I think that it was down. Um, did we? Let's see. I'm looking on the chat on um, on YouTube to just make sure we didn't miss any questions there. Let's see. Just lots of good feedback and. Emojis. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, does anyone else want to share any stories or was there anything that came up that inspired them? And I have one, but I want to give everybody else a chance. Yeah. So um, one of my, and I, I kind of want to share a photo. Let me just bring it up real quick on iNaturalist. Um, so one of my favorite mushrooms that, um, that we found this past year as a group. Um, just one second. Let me see. I should think I can find it on the on the Instagram. So um, it we we had I'd never seen it before, and there had been a couple of people over the past year um, just kind of a, they would they would see it and observe it, take photos of it, um, but it hadn't. No one had sort of looked at it from a microscopy perspective. Um, and, um, so we decided to send it to, um, I did a spore print of it and we sent it. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. So it's just such a beautiful purple mushroom with this sort of almost like cortinarius, you know, the like, uh, viscous cortinarius. Like that's what I thought it was initially. And I was like, okay, I got to do my spore print, see what color the spores are. So if they're rusty, I'll know it's a, a web cap and they ended up being a white color spore print. And so um, I ended up um, sending the spore print over to Alan Rockefeller uh, and he did like a real zoomed in, um, zoomed in um, microscopy on it. I don't know how far zoomed in. He actually put the notes on the iNaturalist observation of it, but um it turns out it's a species that um, has been observed and studied only in Africa, which is kind of cool. And, you know, we had, it hasn't been sort of like, there hasn't been, um, you know, kind of the, the genetic sequencing to see like what this North American species is. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, just talking to people about it, you know, you know, people talk about, you know, well, we have the dust storms, right, from the Saharan desert. And, um, you know, people talk about like the dust and like the spores can get carried in it. So maybe that's, and we just had like a super rainy season. So mm -hmm. we had the opportunity to observe it. Um, and, you know, uh, like this past year, but um, 
it's yeah sorry it's it, I'm sort of going on a little bit long but um no that that mushroom is gorgeous I've always loved and it does look like those courts um and I've always loved how they sort of look like the cosmos like you're mm-hmm. going you're getting into warp speed yeah and it just had a very like cosmic feel to it like something that's was sent here from <laughs> you know <laughs> from another place too yeah. but um the the spores on it are spiky like almost like they have like spike proteins or something so that was even that that was another thing I was like what <laughs> because there's only I think in is like in the only other species of um mushrooms where the spores are kind of spiky mm. um most of them are kind of like you know smooth edges or whatnot um but um but yeah that it's just kind of it it's just fun to like think about you know, so, so much of our research has been focused in like the Western, especially like the taxonomical studies of mushrooms have been so focused in on, um, you know, and where a lot of the funding has, has been too. Yeah. And so uh, it was fun to just peruse around and look at this species. Um, so this is the name, if anyone's curious and look at studies and where it's been observed in Africa. Um, but there's a, there's a few papers that have been written about it. Um, I forget what country in Africa um, where they were found, but just a, a beautiful species. And I definitely want to know more about it. And hopefully we get rain this year so I can see it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <coughs> but yeah, that's my long-winded story <laughs> we have a, a fun little tidbit from some recent field work Ooh, or, nice. uh, couple couple tidbits uh nice. so super timely to for you to be able to attend this presentation because we just got back from uh 10 days working in trinidad and a month in guyana oh wow Dick just looking at fungi and uh we got back two days ago and uh, in I'll, I'll tell about Guyana and let Lauren maybe talk about Trinidad in Guyana. We were at a research lodge and someone was giving a presentation on mushrooms and the presenter, a Guyanese mycologist said, and now I know what comes to your minds when you think of mushrooms, everybody say it. And everybody in the audience all at once said, Jumbi umbrella. <laughs> and we were just like, what? Because we hadn't heard of that. Um, the mycophobia is really rampant in that part of the culture. But then the other side of it is the Am- Amerindians that we worked with um, had a few mushrooms they would eat commonly. And they were an Amanita species in the vaginata section. Mm-hmm. And a clavar, a couple of clavarias that get really big. And they mm-hmm. have a lot of ectomycorrhizal species and that are really like choice edible in many parts of the world, craterellus, cantharellus, latipris. And they don't, at least before the researchers started working with them, um, they didn't eat any of them and actually had some like negative associations with them, even though they're in like extreme abundance and there's endemic species there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was like a mutual exchange when people like this group started uh, working with them and just sharing what would be considered edible in these different cultures. Now they eat their chanterelles. <laughs> and uh, their ability to find mushrooms is just uh, like astounding because there's crazy. there's so much going on in the understory of the tropics and the rainforests and it's just like things that anybody would either overlook just they can just see it so quick and like pull it out. And it's just some of the coolest stuff we got to see were things that um, the Amerindian members of our team were finding. Um, so that was super cool to witness. And and we uh, got in touch with Daniel Winkler who has a spreadsheet of edible mushrooms of the tropics. And mm-hmm. we distributed that. And it was really interesting to watch people's responses because you know, studying mushrooms for the beauty of it or for the science of it is one thing. But it really hits home for people when you go or when they realize, oh, that thing I see every day, I can eat. I can eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
And now a bunch of people are probably going to be trying their kukinas, little those little cups. hairy cups, little yeah. pink ones. Um, can I say like one or two more? Things? Yes, please, so, please. Give too much time. I'm going to be contacting you all. Make oh yeah, no that'd mistake. be so cool. I hope. <laughs> okay. It's great to hear it to your talk because I'm uh, Dominican, and so I it's like. I had just come and all this stuff was on my mind trying to connect like my heritage with like these places we were and their relationship and then coming to see your talk is really great. Um, but so a student who joined us from the University um, of Guyana, the University of Guyana, she was just finishing up her her uh, studies in biology and she was taught, I'm pretty sure even in the in the university that she could not touch the mushrooms. And on her very first day doing the field work with us, she just sees us grabbing mushrooms, sniffing them, passing to each other, hollering about all these different things. And she's like, she didn't say anything to us at first, but then we like were like just kind of going over some things with her and she was like, we were like, you know, you can like touch them all, right? And she's like, I did not know that and was very concerned when I saw you guys touching all of them. <laughs> and uh, just another of uh, one of the people we were staying with in Trinidad too, she's just said, I didn't know mushrooms grew here on the island that has just incredible diversity. And on day one, and then every day we were bringing mushrooms home and baking them in our oven to, to try to preserve them. And <laughs> it was just uh, really a lot of interesting things learned on, on many sides, so yeah now I'm thinking about all of the ways that I want to like anyone who has stories like these um and especially you two you're fresh from the tropics now um I I'm gonna be starting to approach folks like there's a new forestry um program at um the University of West Indies in um in um the Jamaican campus and I, I'm like twiddling my thumbs or like, you know, sort of trying to get prepared to approach folks with like my, how, will you let me come with you on, you know, your walks through, they just designate, designated a um, national forest for the first time in Kingston also, are outside of Kingston. And I think that having folks who have recently done field work would be a great way to be like it's not just me a dorky writer who wants to like you know follow along and like um hear what see if you all are doing um this kind of stuff because they don't have a mycology de department and um anyway I'm babbling but I want to use you all <laughs> if you <laughs> consent to be used in this way um because there are all sorts of projects that you know I hope will uh, be started up in this way that's incredible we that'd be great we actually vouchered what we found at the University of West Indies in Trinidad and okay kind of just got feet on feet on the ground there um to start mycology in their herbarium again um yeah we'd love to connect you with everybody we met in we're going to be back there so just stay in touch all right sweet thank you again thank you <laughs> are you are you talking to us angel unmuted <laughs> <laughs> yeah does anyone else have a story they want to share Yeah. Well, I loved seeing that connection made. That's one of the beautiful things about Zoom and doing more stuff online as if we don't do enough online, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And for those of you all who um, met, direct messaged me, um with opportunities thank you so much if you would like to um email me you can email me at mp maria rights i'll put it in the chat also mp maria rights um at gmail.com and that's rights as in w-r-i-t-e-s um and i'll get that um the recipe and um uh, we'll put the recording up on our blog in a few days so check back for that too so I definitely want to try cooking that that dish 
yeah. see if I can hunt down some of those mushrooms on Etsy, go on a little <laughs> internet for forage. <laughs> you gonna like it. You gonna like it. It's so good. <laughs> All right. Well, if we don't have anything else. We'll sign off for the night. And just to let everyone know, we're, um, our next talk will be with uh, Colin Averill. Uh, he's one of the scientists working on the Spun Underground Mycorrhizal Mapping Project. And so we're excited that they will be joining us next month to talk about how we can all be part of this uh, global project. So yeah. so. Once again, Maria, thank you so much for your everything, your beautiful presentation, humor, just bringing so much to us tonight. So we love it. <laughs> All right. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks for joining. <laughs>